Hello everyone. Today is um, Tuesday, November the 20th, 2018. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to go about um, structuring this video. I would just like to ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide everything that I say and uh, put together and do what I cannot do because this subject is just um, you know it's bigger than me so pray for me and I need your help um, so what I want to talk about is the other day I was asking the Lord I haven't been on here for a while, but it's not because, uh, you know, the Lord has not been um, showering things on me so much so that I don't even know. It's like a tiger that I don't know where to grab it from. And it's not the Lord's fault that I feel overwhelmed, it's because I don't, the fault is in me. It's because I don't immediately make the video. Then things kind of get piled up on me. And then that, you know, creates this anxiety. And then the next dream comes and then I still got the old dream. And then I'm like, ah, so it is entirely my fault. And the reason why I don't just come and snap make a video is because I have my idea of how I need to make this video of how I need to get the point across instead of just you know come on here press record and you know let the Lord lead guide and direct I feel like uh, you know, that's not good enough. I'm not going to do it right. And, and I need to organize my thought. And then I didn't say this and I didn't say that. But I need to just let all that go and trust the Lord because I'm seeing it's not working. Me trying to wait and, and uh, you know, organize it and get it all just right and look up these scriptures and have it all just so all that's doing is backing things up until there's just literally hundreds of dreams that I have not shared with you and and leading to um, me being very exhausted after making a video. Um, so I'm going to try and move away from that. I am going to move away from that. God be my strength. Um, it's hard not to rely on yourself. It's hard. We may say that we're trusting in God, but if you really look at what you're doing, you're really, we, we really want to, you know, help God out more than what we want to admit. So anyway, so here I am, I'm going to, I don't want to use the word wing it, but I'm just going to, uh, Ask the spirit of the living God to speak to you, you know, in a way that I'm inadequate to do. That's not false humility. That's real. All right. On um, so you have to bear with me also not going to be so organized. You just have to bear with me. So anyway, I was asking the Lord, I think I started to say this, I was asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to say? You know, there's so much piled up, you know, which one of these things should I tell first? You know, which one? Because, you know, clearly I don't I, I don't know how I could ever catch up. I guess I'll try if the Lord is willing. All right. So anyway, in this dream. So I asked the Lord that. What do you want me to say? Where should I start? Uh, you know, so far behind. So 
on 11-15, I had this dream after asking that question. So I was driving down a street. Times were bad. So there was just trouble. Just the general atmosphere when you breathe in and you breathe out was trouble. So I had to merge to the right. I don't know why, for some reason, you know, it went down to one lane and I had to get over to the right. So I had to get in front of some cars. So I had to kind of cut them off right quick. So recognizing that, you know, that wasn't the most polite thing to do. I sort of hung back so that, you know, those that were irritated with that could get around me before the other lane totally disappeared so they could, you know, just go around me. So like about three or four cars went around me and, um, so then after that, I had a lane again. This, um, this was on an asphalt city street. There were two lanes and it was on a very gray day. It was very gray. Okay. There were in this lane that I was riding in. Now I'm back in the left-hand lane. I had to move over to the right for a little bit. Then I got back into the left-hand lane. For some reason, I had to stay in that left-hand lane. It was like there were cars traveling in the right-hand lane, but I don't know what was going on, but I had to stay in this in this left-hand lane. So um, there were giant cracks in the street. So in order to drive, I had to keep like... Um, going over the line into the right-hand lane. I didn't move all the way into the right-hand lane, but I had to keep crossing that white line into their lane, going around these big cracks. Um, and like I said, for some reason, I wasn't able to change into that lane. It was like the left-hand lane was my lane, and the cracks were worse in the left-hand lane. Okay, some were as big as the car. Some of these cracks were actually as big as the car. And they were every few feet, like every 10 feet or so, there was a crack so huge that I had to go around it. So there is a, a um, Christian entertainer by the name of Kim Burrell. She's, um, she lives in, wow, forgot this. She lives in California. She's from California. I don't know exactly where she lives now, but she is from California. And uh, it was as if she was on the radio and she was singing a song and she was mentioning different men that are proposed to be ad admirable or something like heroes to black people. She said a few, and each time she would say, no, 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 no. Then she said, the one I remember her saying was, um, she said JFK, that was the only white man that I remember that she mentioned. And then after each one, she would say, no, 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 no. Like, is that going to be our champion? No, 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 no. And um, so she rejected all of them. She would say their name and then say, no, 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 no. And they all should have been rejected. They None of them were uh, someone that should be admired in the black community or any community. Then finally, her choice was MLK, Martin Luther King. Um, nobody used to say MLK until they started naming streets after him everywhere. So then it got shortened to MLK. So it always used to be Dr. Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King. 
So So when she said Martin Luther King, which I knew, he followed wicked doctrines, doctrines of devils. This man did not have sound Christian doctrine at all. I'm not going to take time to look up his doctrines, but you can look up the um, his scholarly writings, which they say were plagiarized anyway. But you can look up his doctrines. They were not sound Christian doctrines. They were uh, heresy, flat out damning heresies. So look that up. So I knew that he had doctrines of devils and a unholy life to boot. So I knew that the real example was C.H. Mason. This was in this dream. So, like I said, I had just asked God before I fell asleep, what did he want me to do? Now I know he wants me to prioritize the Mason Church of God in Christ project. And then I said, done, I'm going to do it. So I wanted that to be the very next video that I made. It will more than likely be a series of videos because there's a lot and I want to do it justice. I want to um, give it the the depth that it deserves. It, it's not something that needs to be glossed over. It, it's something that needs to be foundational and a foundation well laid and well set. So, Bishop Mason. So what I did from there, um, I started digging into my research on Bishop Mason, who um, I want to say, if if you would say I grew up in any church, because um, up until I was about. 16, 17, we did not go to church at all. Um, my parents were not Christian. My father was an atheist. Um, prior to my, me being born, he was saved. Or it might have been when I was a baby also, but by the time I was coherent, and able to have any sort of conversation with my dad. His contention was he would tell me there's no God. He lived in California and he was very much into new age philosophies, new age gurus, and um, yeah, all that stuff, like weird Eastern garbage, uh, oh, him and Oprah would have had a field day. So the closest person that I could say that did tell us something about God would have been my mother's mother. Because and my father's mother was a very godly woman, but she died when I was very young. I only have like two memories of her maybe three. And in those memories, she was never talking. She didn't talk a lot. She wasn't, you know, gushy, going to put you on her lap and, you know, bounce you and play. She had a lot of kids. And then she started having a lot of grandkids. So she was sort of a no-nonsense person from what I remember. But you felt very welcome, very safe, she was very um, stable and solid. So anyway, but my mother's mother was, you know, alive until I became a young adult. And she would tell us um, different things. She would tell us that she, if she, she said, I see in my mind's eye. And I know now that was, you know, 
Maybe she was having a vision or something. And she would just tell us that different little things about the Lord. So from that, we developed a fear of God. And there was a very short period of time, I just remember this, when I was about 12, where we did go to this church, but it was, it was, it ended up very bad. The, it was only for maybe six months or so. And the pastor ended up sleeping with different women and he was, it was horrible. That was terrible. So that ended very badly. And that very man to this day is on YouTube in utter heresy. He has denounced Christ. He was off in some, um, it's sort of uh, an African, Afrocentric type religion. Is not Hebrew Israelites, but it, it seemed like he started off in that vein and now he's just gone. It's he, what he's into is so foul. I won't even listen to it. It is just pure um, d- uh, demonized things that come out of his mouth. So I will not even. Uh, and I also had the misfortune in 2016 after 35 years. This man shows up at the door. And I was making a video. This was in 2016 in the summer. And I'm sitting there at that little um, desk thing in the kitchen, making a video. And I had to abort that video because I didn't have a way to pause and start the video over again. So I just started over. But um, I was interrupted with him ringing the doorbell literally after 35 years. And I, I didn't know about his heresies at that time. I might have known a little bit about it, but um, oh, it was just surreal. It was like the Antichrist coming to your door. And he, he said, are you Beverly? Because he came there looking for my mom. But I, I said yes. I did not invite him in at all. I was very um, watchful of my words because I, he was just, I could tell he was just demonic. And I would just let my yes be yes, my no be no, and sent him on his way. So um, that was weird. But anyway, um, so that was an occasion where we had some contact with church as a young person. So I didn't have a home foundation of God at all. And what we were exposed to was full of hypocrisy. It was full of people that will tell you, well, yeah, there's a God and, you know, um, kids obey your parents, but parents can do whatever they want. It was just that kind of stuff that make you be like, you know, if this is so serious, how come you don't do it? It was that kind of thing. And I was just that kind of kid. I was the kind of kid like, uh, you get the respect that you give. And that, that made sense to me. Like, I, you know, if you don't respect me, I'm not going to respect you. That's, that, that just made sense to me at that time. And I didn't know any better. So everything I found out about God really had to be him teaching me. After I was an adult and I began to seek him in my 
very late 20s, early 30s. Um, so, but as a teenager, we did end up going to a church of God in Christ. And my mother's father had been a pastor in the Church of God in Christ. His father was a pastor in the Church of God in Christ. Her mother and the generation before them were in the Church of God in Christ. So, so many generations back to the the, the the onset of the Church of God in Christ. The Church of God in Christ was founded in 1907. And that's how far back my great-grandparents were involved. You know, back in that, back in the, the early teens, of the 1900s. But I wasn't exposed to that until my, you know, late teens. And even there, there was corruption. There was corruption. It was a, I'm going to tell you what's right but I'm not going to live what's right. And in the midst of that church, there were saints. There were godly men and women. There were Holy Ghost filled people that um, created enough of an impression that stuck with me. But As is often the case, uh, even if three wheels are working well and one wheel is flat, the car is not going anywhere. So there was also in the middle of that, in the midst of that church, starting in the pulpit, corruption and foulness and hypocrisy. Uh, grievous sins, grievous sin, horrible sin, rumors, nothing but rumors. And it was not a true godly example. Someone who, for the most part, preached the truth, but a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And one specific doctrine, too, that they that that was wrong in that church was I actually remember this pastor saying that when people get married, this was his reasoning saying that marriage wasn't permanent. Marriage was not a covenant, a lifelong covenant. He agreed that divorce was a sin and all that stuff. But his thing was, well, it may not be, since it's not possible in all cases for people to be reconciled after they get a divorce, it must be okay that they remarry. If your former spouse is not willing to reconcile, then you know, that just must make you free. He said, well, you know, I've seen people that got convicted about their divorce and they went to reconcile with their spouse and that spouse has moved on. So he was saying, you know, don't, don't divorce your second spouse in order to reunite with your first spouse. If your first spouse doesn't want to be with you, which um, is just not in line with the scripture. If it's just something that you think is convenient or sounds better to you, 
that doesn't make it the scripture. That's that's called you leaning to your own understanding. We follow the scriptures. We stay in line and in harmony with what God said. We don't we don't uh, work to our convenience. Oh, that's not convenient for me. That's inconvenient. I'm not going to do it. So, and the other thing that I used to hear him say, which was horrible, he would say things like this. He would say this often. Those men back there that formed the church in the early 1900s, he said they were um, farmers and sharecroppers and they couldn't read or they didn't read well. They had bad understanding and they, um, their doctrines were according to a bad understanding. He said, well, you know, God honored what they believed or what they thought, what they taught. And the one example and the only example he would always give was they would say, marvel not. When Jesus said, you know, marvel, marvel not that I say this or that unto you. And they, he said that there were men, in other words, they're calling them ignorant and unlearned men. And they would say that since they would say they saw marvel not, and so they would forbid their kids to play with marbles because they thought it was marble knot. Now, what it was, there might have been some people that thought that. And the reason is um, a lot of young men would gamble with marbles. And it was very akin to rolling dice. So they would forbid their kids to, to do it. They already believed that that was something that could not be done, that should not be done. And then when they saw that scripture, marvel not, then they thought it was marvel not. So he used to use that as his, his um, quintessential example of why these men were ignorant and why we shouldn't stick to the doctrines that they left. The founders and the pioneers of the great church of God in Christ. Now, if you want to tell your kids don't play marbles, I think that's great. Fine, whatever. You, you can set whatever rules you want in your house. And I don't think that that's a big deal that they mix that scripture up. There, there are scriptures to this day that I'm getting the full meaning of. No big deal. I remember my mom used to always use this scripture. And, and really, at the heart of it, she's a fearful, anxious person. Sort of a worrier. And she'll tell you that. Always been a worrier. So when she would use this scripture, and, and I believe it was passed down to her this way, the scripture was always used. She would always say, the Bible says, be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. And her interpretation of that scripture was that you just need to watch out for everything. You just need to constantly be walking on eggshells and looking over your shoulder. Okay, then... I don't even know if I was saved. I think I was. I read that scripture and immediately when I read it, I was like, and I'm just a babe. I'm like, that's not what that scripture means. That's not what that's saying. Jesus was comforting when he said that. Or that wasn't even Jesus. I think that was Paul. Philippians. So that was Paul. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God.
and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So th- that was a comforting scripture. Not be careful for nothing. Ooh. And behind every little corner, something spooky and something after you. But that's not what that meant. It, it meant be anxious for nothing. I mean, don't be controlled by fear. So, you know, it didn't take a farmer or a sharecropper to misinterpret a scripture. And that doesn't mean that everything and the doctrines that they pass down as the foundations of this church, the church of God in Christ, if I didn't say that, that's what I'm talking about that the foundations of that church were to all be, you know, shuffled all behind us. Just chuck them behind you. Because these were ignorant farmers that went to the fifth grade and stopped if they went there. And it was true. In his youth, Bishop C.H. Mason, the founder, had no formal education until he got older. I don't don't know what he did, but he was the child of slaves. He was born in 19, he was born in, no, 18, 1866, 1866. Okay, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed on January 1st, 1863, three years before the man was born. The Emancipation Proclamation or Proclamation 95, I'm reading from Wikipedia, was a presidential proclamation or executive order. Um, The Antichrist Barack Obama made those famous. I never heard of it. I never heard that phrase until he came and just, you know, shoot them out like lightning bolts. Issued by the United States President Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863, it changed the federal legal status of more than 3.5 million enslaved African Americans in the designated areas of the South from slave to free. So three years before this man was born, his parents were slaves. (sighs) Ah. So is it any wonder that he didn't have any schooling? Okay. When he would have done what what people do now, which is, you know, start, there's no head start. Okay. To get a head start on turning your child into an atheist. To get a head start on disrupting the bond between parents and children. But when he would have even started kindergarten, they were still in the field. So they they went from slaves in that they could leave the plantation, but their lifestyle was still uh, one of service, servitude. They still worked on plantations because these plantations didn't just burn up the day that that happened. They just had to develop a different system of compensation for the slaves, which was um, a sharecropper model where the, um, the people became tenant farmers. And the plantation owners, more often than not, most often, would just rig a financial arrangement with these newly freed slaves whereby 
the slave was pretty much still indentured to him. They lived at still a subsistence level and they would, you know, rig it so that this person always owed them more money than what they were able to generate through the crops that they would grow. And they do it by whatever means necessary, rigging the, the weights, changing the price of the cotton or whatever crop they were picking, tobacco, whatever it was. In um, Mississippi, which is, I believe that's where, no, Bishop Mays was born in, he was either born in Mississippi or Arkansas, but in Mississippi, I know the crop was cotton. And that's where both my parents were born and my grandmother actually picked cotton not as a quote unquote slave, but you know, that was their job. All right. So just bear with me while I try and do this here. Cause I have to do this. I absolutely have to do this. I am charged to do this, to let you know who this man was, to let you know who C.H. Mason was, please be patient. And if there ends up being more than one video, watch it. Because you, you need to get this down in, in your, um, you need to incorporate this into the fabric of who you are. Because we don't have any examples like this right now. We don't have any living, breathing people to look at that can, that allowed God to use them so much that they truly had the mind of Christ. They would, tr that he truly let this mind be in him, which was also in Christ Jesus. So I want to read you a little bit about his early life. I don't know what happened. Oh, I know what happened. All right. So here we go. Oh, boy. I got to find this is in a, in a, in a bookmark. Oh, well. So, this is what I've found out about Bishop Mason. This is what Wikipedia says about him. There are different um, dates about his birth, but the most reliable sources that I've found were that he was born in 1866 on September the 8th. Um, his parents were former slaves, Jerry and Eliza Mason, and he was born in Shelby County, Tennessee. It says he and his family lived in an unincorporated area near Bartlett. Mason worked with his family sharecropping as he did not receive an early formal education. So here's a little reference about sharecropping. It says, it is a form of agriculture in which a landowner allows a tenant to use the land in return for a share of the crops produced on their portion of the land. Sharecropping has a long history and there are a wide range of different situations and type of agreements. Um, so a lot of times sharecropping was just a way to rip off the tenants and make sure they'd always be, um, they'd always owe you money and you'd pretty much just be using their labor for free. Anyway, so when he was 
14, no, when he was 12, they left this um, plantation that they worked on because um, yellow fever broke out. And they left. A year later, his father died of yellow fever. They moved to um, Arkansas. And his father died shortly after that. Jerry died. And then a year after that, Bishop Mason got tuberculosis. So one Sunday, he was um, miraculously healed. He had, um, he saw, he had a vision of the Lord and God healed him. And then he got baptized by his brother. He had a half brother that was a preacher in the Baptist church. And that's where they all came out of. They were, they were Baptists. The Baptist had evangelized the Negroes and that was the persuasion of the most of the slaves was a, a Baptist way of interpreting the scriptures. So um, his father died. He got tuberculosis and he had a miraculous healing. After that, he was converted and baptized, and um, he became a very conscientious believer. He took the Lord and religion very seriously, but he was Baptist. So now you want to say, well, what's wrong with Baptists? The same thing that's wrong with Baptists today is that they do not... They have been taught that there is no need for man to repent of sin. And to repent means to change your mind about doing something. When people, when it's described in different places in the Old Testament, when God was going to punish or destroy some people for their actions, even wicked Ahab, King Ahab, a king of Israel, who did wickedly beyond anyone that was ever before him. When he had a pronouncement of judgment against him, the Bible says that he put on sackcloth and ashes. And the, and the Bible says that the Lord repented of what he was going to do to Ahab and decided to do it after his death. So does that mean that the God was going to do something wicked? Does, does repent mean strictly that you've sinned and you say you're sorry for sinning? Or you just merely ask someone to forgive you? No, that's not the meaning of the word to repent because God doesn't sin and he does not need to ask anyone for forgiveness. Repenting means that you change your mind and stop doing something. You change your mind and don't do it. That's what it means to repent. Now being sorry apologizing and all that other stuff, that may be something that goes along with why you repent. But the word repent itself is to change your mind and not do something. So when God tells us to repent of our sins, he is telling us to change and not do it. Short of that, you're not forgiven. You're not forgiven of anything you didn't repent of. 
So that's what's wrong with Baptist then, and that's what's wrong with Baptist theology now, Baptist doctrine right now. Now, with all that being said, there are people like Bishop Mason that were conscientious toward God. And they weren't, they didn't latch on to the loopholes and excuses that were created by the doctrines that they've been taught. Oh, don't worry about it. God understands. He knows my heart. Jesus died for my sins. I have Baptist relatives. And I have Baptist relatives that no better that left holiness to go back to vomit. And then I have relatives that have been Baptists all their lives. And, and they are more honorable than the relatives who left what was holy. And I have many of them who left what was holy and what was the truth to go um, and dishonor the grace of God and make it into something that it's not. So Bishop Mason, he was Baptist like everybody around him was Baptist. That was the predominant religion of the slaves. And of the South in general, really. They were Baptist. So he was baptized in a Baptist church. He, um, he felt a call to preach. He was uh, licensed in a Baptist church. So in 1893, at the age of 27, Bishop Mason began his own ministerial career by accepting a local license from the Mount Gale Missionary Baptist Church in Preston, Arkansas. Very conscientious. On November 1st, 1893... Same, age 27, he entered the Arkansas Baptist College. But he withdrew after three months because of his dissatisfaction with their curriculum and methodology. I listened to a recording made in Bishop Mason's own voice. This has been about three years ago, where he tells the account of him being in this Bible college. He like to say he stayed three months and God told him to leave. He said, leave here and I will give you wisdom and I think wisdom and understanding that no man will be able to gainsay nor resist. He said, God said that to him and it's a scripture. Because he saw that these things that these people were teaching in these in the in that Bible college and in, in all the Bible colleges were against the scriptures. They were doctrines of men and doctrines of devils that were inconsistent with the scriptures. He saw the scriptures calling men to repent. And calling men to live holy, sanctified lives. Which leads to the problem that he encountered. So he left those, he left the Bible college. And he would often say later on through his life. Do not fill your head with college stuff that does not edify. Do 
Now, some people may say that Bishop Mason was against schooling, he, that he was against formal education. And I would say that he was against a um, a seminary type experience where a person goes off to one of these institutions and learns things that are not in the Bible. The Bible and the Holy Spirit should be your seminary experience. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth. So why are you going to go off into an institution that's teaching lies to get credentialed? So that's what he was against. And if he was alive to see what schools are doing to children today, he'd be against that too. They had a different way of um, transmitting Bible knowledge, the wisdom of God, and knowledge of the scriptures. It was very informal, but it was extremely effective. One issue that I took with the pastor that I told you about that um, that was in the Church of God in Christ, the one that used to criticize the founders of this church by saying, oh, you know, they were farmers and, you know, they didn't they weren't educated and and they used to misinterpret the scriptures. That's you know, that's that's why we're uh, not following their doctrines to the letter. Because, you know, they, they had it wrong. They meant well. God honored what they thought. No, those old men had it right. When, as I have been researching Bishop Mason, I am astounded by his understanding of the scriptures because the understanding of those old men is so far beyond anything I've ever heard come out of a preacher's mouth in in real life as I read their writings, as I listen to things that were recorded. Bishop Mason, like he said, the Lord said he would give him wisdom. I'm gonna find that scripture. Luke chapter 21, verse 15. It says, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. The word gainsay means to deny or to contradict, to dispute, to oppose, to contest, to challenge, to counter, rebut. So, and that's how 
Bishop Mason was. Through this, hopefully I'll get to it in this video, but if not in subsequent videos, where I will read to you the things that this man said, the, um, the gravity of his life and of his prayer life and of the miracles, the, the humility. There, I don't, I've never known a man like this. The things that are reported of him. So, where is this thing at? Here it is. In 2015, how, how did all this come about for me? In 2015, I met a man. I knew of the man because he was um, a friend of my mother's, old man. I ran into him by accident, by, 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 um, it wasn't on purpose at all. It's just, just a happening, which we all know there's no coincidences. So I've told this story before I came to visit. I was visiting my father and I left. <laughs> Unexpectedly. Hi, buddy. And sorry about that. Hi, I left Hi. unplanned. And, and went to visit my mother. She wasn't there, but she had guests. I know that sounds strange, but she had guests. But she was two and a half hours away, out of town. So I, th I had a key. So I don't know if I had a key or if I knocked on the door. But um, I get there, and these two strangers answer my mother's door. An old man, he was 78 at that time. I hate to call him an old man because he wasn't like, you know, a feeble old man or anything like that, but you know, that that's an older gentleman. And his niece. And he came up because He has a burden that I have no doubt that God gave him. And this burden is to cry out to the church of God in Christ. To call out to them. And let them know to turn. He has a ministry. I think it's called Old Path Ministries. He's written books and pamphlets. And he's just, he's just got a one-track mind. And that is a broken heart for the fallen state of the church of God in Christ. He's like Paul, how he had a broken heart for Israel. Paul longed for Israel to return to God. His heart was broken that the children of Abraham rejected the one that they all said they were waiting for. That they have forsaken the living God. And that's how this man is. And that is literally the condition of the church of God in Christ. Throughout the Bible, the history of the children of Israel was that as the Lord said, their goodness is like the dew on the grass. And like 
like clouds on a hot day. They quickly, uh, it quickly evaporates. That's how long they're good. They're afflicted. They cry out to the Lord. As soon as they're relieved, they forget God again. So, and throughout the Old Testament, the Lord would, they, they would be afflicted because of wickedness, because of, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 28. If they fail to follow the Lord, curses followed. And they would cry out to God because things were horrible. Because they turned out against, they turned against him, and he would always send a deliverer. But as soon as that man or that judge, or whether it was Moses, or whether it was Joshua, or whether it was Samuel, or whether it was a godly king, as soon or a priest like Jehoiada, as soon as that man was dead, all their following the Lord would fall apart too. They were only good as long as that priest or that king or, or that man of God or that prophet was, was with them. And when he would die and fall off the, the scene, the people would go away. Like when Moses went up into the mountain. And they said, oh, Moses is gone. We don't know what happened to him. Make us some gods, Aaron. And this is how it is. If the leadership is following God, there's a better chance that the people will follow God. And when that godly, strong leader is gone, so is the people's determination to follow the Lord. So as Bishop Mason began to wane in his strength, because he led the church for over 60 years, as his strength began to wane, the force of his leadership I'm trying to figure out how long he led the church. So, formally as the church of God in Christ and him being the chief overseer was 54 years. But there was a... Um, another iteration of the Church of God in Christ that was started in 1897, 10 years before that, which there was a co-founder, and his name was C.P. Jones. Him and Bishop Mason were friends. Both of them were excommunicated from the Baptist church because they shared a belief that God required men to be holy. They rejected doctrines of once saved, always saved. They rejected doctrines that faith alone without works is salvation. Uh, they rejected doctrines that you continue in sin and, and Jesus died for you to continue in sin. So he, along with C.P. Jones, C.P. Jones as the um, leader was the first part of the Church of God in Christ. And I'm going to tell you about what happened in 1907 that separated these two friends that had joined together on account of holiness. 
They believed that men needed to be sanctified and holy. They believed that the scriptures taught that. And they chose to trust the scriptures rather than man-made doctrines. Rather than someone coming and telling you, this is the doctrine of our denomination and this is what we believe. This is our statement of faith. But if your statement of faith is inconsistent with the scriptures, you better burn it and follow Jesus. So I met this man, like I said, quite by chance. And he and his niece were at my mother's house alone. So I knew that they were, that he was coming to visit and, and work on his, his life work, his, his book. Like I said, he has a burden from the Lord about a, a crying out in him like Jeremiah for the church of God in Christ and, and for what he knew and for the godliness that they have let slip. So he was there. They opened the door and, and they greeted me. They were happy to see me because I think they had been there like a week all alone. They didn't have a car. And they were just happy to see me. <laughs> they were happy to see me because they were stranded. And where the house uh, is, it's kind of, um, there's nothing in walking distance. And it's kind of like the main road is a, is a almost a country road. It's not a dirt road, but it doesn't have sidewalks. You're not going to be walking down that street unless you want to get killed. So, um, yeah, there's no shoulder and the speed limit, I think is like 45 miles an hour and just two lanes, one going each way. You want to get killed. Yeah. That's where you walk. And, um, it's several miles before you would get to anything. So I came First thing we did was take a walk. I think, what did we do? Yeah, we took a walk. I'm not sure why. Me, him, his niece, who's a grown woman. She's my age. Was there anyone else with us? It seemed like there was more. It was so joyful. It was so joyful. His... um. Yeah, we took a walk. It was in August, early August of 2015. And we just talked about the Lord, me, him, and his niece. And like a, a man does when a man has a burden, it didn't take long before his burden started to come out. And he began to tell me about this church. He began to tell me about the way it was in the church of God in Christ. He began to tell me the way it was with those old saints and how they were so radically different from the way we are now. And for what passes for church. And he began to tell me about this man that I'd only heard about in passing, Bishop Mason. Now, if you know anything about the Church of God in Christ, you've heard that name. And you you hear that 
The name is very revered. You may hear a few of the legendary stories, but I'm going to tell you that you really don't know that man. And you want to get to know that life, the life that he left on record. The church that God used him to build. The doctrines that he left in this world, which are just doctrines of the Bible, rightly divided and lived out in farmers and ex-slaves and children of slaves and maids and servants and These people were something that you haven't seen. It's something that we all do well to hear about, and that's what I'm going to endeavor to do. So this man, the older gentleman, and his niece and I, spent about they changed their tickets because they were supposed to go back home, him back to Mississippi and his niece back out to the West, to the West coast. And they changed their tickets. We were having such a marvelous time together. It was joyful because we were talking about the Lord for one and two, they had been stranded before I got there. They didn't really have any money. His niece was a school teacher and it was the end of the summer. And you know, school teachers don't get paid in the summer. So she, she really was traveling, you know, on his good graces and he's an an older retired man living off social security. So they were on a shoestring. So when I got there, I had transportation and I had money and we put all that together. And, and the third reason why we were having such a marvelous time was that where I had just left, I was among the godless. I mean, I was among some people that, you know, if the mark of the beast was brought before them tomorrow, they, they get it stamped right on them. Give, you know, they get their RFID chip. They be at the front of the line. And they were, um, man, they were, they were against me. And that same time when I was visiting them, my, my father, where I came from, it's not that, you know, they purposely do these things. They just don't believe what you believe. And, and since they, you know, pretty much belong to the devil, he can use them at will. He can get in them. So I had asked the Lord, well, it, it just, it seemed I was sitting there, there at their house, and I was saying, it just seemed like I was just having a conversation with the Lord. And it was like, you want to know more? I can tell you some stuff. I can show you some things. But it's going to, that people are going to think you're crazy. I was like, I don't care, Lord. Yeah, tell me. All right, no one's going to believe you. I don't care. Tell me. 
you know, is, is going to set you aside. I don't care. I want to know. Of course, Lord. Yes, I want to know. Do you, you really want to know? Yeah, I want to know. Is going to do this, 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 and this. That doesn't matter. I want to know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to know. Now, you saying all that, like the John and James telling Jesus, oh, we, we want to sit on your right hand or on your left. Oh, Jesus, can you drink the cup that I have to drink? Yeah, we can drink it. We can drink it. But you don't know what that cup is going to taste like. You don't really understand how bitter that cup is going to be. And at the time, it really doesn't matter to you. Like Elisha, when Elijah was leaving, when was going to die. And he asked him, what, what do you want? What should I do for you? And he said, I want to double. Elisha told Elijah, I want a double portion of your anointing. And Elijah said, oh, you have asked a hard thing. But nevertheless, if you're with me, when I go up, you'll have it. See, Elish, Elijah, he knew what it was like. You know, Elisha knew that Elijah called fire down from heaven. Elisha saw all the powerful acts that God did through Elijah. But he hadn't experienced the loneliness. He hadn't experienced the rejection, the isolation, the bitterness of the disrespect of those that hate you and hate God and say they don't. So I told the Lord, yeah, 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 yeah. Lord, tell me. Yeah, I want to know what's going on. What's going on? And that was just the beginning. That was just the beginning. And yet, you know what? To this day, I say, tell me more. Tell me more, Lord. It's going to isolate you even further. Yeah, God, I still want more of you. The more of God that you get, the more like God that you become, the less relatable you are to the world and the people in the world. So... The older gentleman and his niece, they changed their tickets because they were set to fly out like the next day or a day later. And we were having such a marvelous time. They, they both changed their tickets and we made plans to help the old gentleman. That's what his niece was doing there in the first place, to help him to get this burden out and to get it out in a, in a modern fashion, to take advantage um, of the internet and to take advantage of the new ways of recording and disseminating information. Because, you know, he came from the time of, of uh, cassette recorders and papers and Xerox. I'm going to close my door just one second.
Okay, I'm getting so stiff sitting here. Okay, so she and I had the idea that we could um, just help him. It, it was as though he were in labor with a baby, but the baby was stuck and he was frustrated and weary. And it was just, we, we needed to do something to help him get this, deliver this burden. So, because it, it was just like, he was bursting with it, but he, he, I don't know. It's one of those things like, you don't know, when have I said enough? When God tells you to cry loud and spare not, you know, when have you, when, when what is loud enough? How many people do you need to tell? It's like he never felt finished. So I want to do my part to... I don't know, help to breathe his burden and to carry that baton and maybe pass it to another person if there's time. So we went to like Best Buy and Staples and bought a, a camcorder a tripod, um, a printer, and I sat down with the man and I interviewed him for like three or four days. And it was such a blessing. And I think the first thing I asked him, I'm going to put up, it's a series of videos and I'm going to, they were made in um, late July, early August, the last few days of July and the first couple days of August of 2015. And we all three were so blessed as this went on to get these things out of the heart and mind of this man and to make them alive again and let allow them to come into our bellies and into our consciousness so that he didn't share this this uh, this burden alone so that this great knowledge would not just be hidden in a vessel but it would be, you know, th that candlestick that's that's meant to give light. You know, you don't put it in a bushel. You put it on a candlestick. So I'm hoping that people can come to appreciate what was gone before they were born. And that is the true fire that came in those people that were in, around, and immediately following that Azusa Street revival to just be a link back to something that happened, you know, what, 111 years ago now, 112 years ago. Started in 1906. To, to make alive again what happened then and to know that it's the same God and it's the same Holy Ghost. Because the devil's been trying to throw dirt on that thing and bury it and, and slip us a substitute And calling it that grand old church, which it's not. It's not the same thing. So 
I'll put up some of those videos of me interviewing this older gentleman about all the people that he's talked to. Like I said, he, he's been doing, I think he said it's been like 50 or 60 years that he's been on this mission. He had a whole suitcase full of stuff. He had recordings of old saints that he went and visited and, and recorded their accounts of their encounters with Bishop Mason and with the old church and the way it was. And, and it, he brought it so to life. And it didn't take anything for you to see where it was, where it came from, and the woeful state of disrepair that it is in right now. You would take this general board and you'd take them out back and throw rocks on them if you just had any idea of where it all started and how far it's fallen. They are truly like the children of Israel who have forgotten their God and gone a-whoring after other gods. God told me it's not hard to be an idolater. It's not hard at all. You don't have to build a golden calf. So... With, he had a booklet. I think he might have written this book, but the majority of this book is excerpts from something called the 1926 yearbook. So that's 19 years into the formation of the Church of God in Christ at their, um, and inside of it are excerpts of sermons. So to be able to actually read sermons that were spoken by Bishop Mason. And you can, you can feel that these sermons were Holy Ghost breathed. The man's sermons were it was it would be like in Matthew where after they listened to the um sermon on the mount how they said um let's see if i can find this When they would listen to Jesus, mm -mm -mm. oh, here, there it was. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. All they'd ever had was the scribes. But when Jesus came, they said things like, let me see if I can find it. I think it's Matthew chapter 9. Mm-mm-mm. Uh, give me, bear with me, I pray you. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. 
Hmm. Okay. John. I was in the wrong book there. John chapter 7. Listen to this here. Jesus said, so Matthew chapter, no, no, St. John chapter 7, verse 24 says, judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am of him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priest sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. Where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go that I shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he hath said? What manner of this, what manner of saying is this that he said? Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If a man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers and the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? See, they, gave, they had given an order that he should be captured. Why have you not brought him? Who is the problem? The leaders, the leadership. The chief priests. 46. The officers answered, Never man spake like this. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? When something comes from God, it's spoken against. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. This is how they spoke of the false prophets. 
But if you read your Bible, you know what happened to the true prophets. Jesus said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto you. Forty-six. The officers answered, "Never man spake like this man." When you hear the sermons of Bishop Mason, I'm, I never heard anything like this before in my life. It's like the words are coming straight from the Spirit and out of His mouth. He tells a story of how after he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Azusa, he tells the whole story. I'm going to read it to you. Then he asked the Lord. He wanted to know what he was saying because it's an unknown tongue. And and most people that have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost do not know what they're saying. And on occasion, you may know. That's how it is with me. I don't always know. I most of the time, don't know. Most of the time. 95, 97% of the time, don't know. have any idea. It's just edifying to your soul. So... Um, He said he asked the Lord to to interpret. He wanted to be able to interpret what he was saying so that when he spoke in tongues, that people would know what the Spirit was saying. Because speaking in tongues is the Holy Spirit speaking through you. And it edifies you just because it's being touched. You're being touched by the spirit. But there's also a message in that, that when it is interpreted, interpreted, you know. Now, when you hear this man pray, and because there are some recordings of him praying, there are not many recordings of him because this was a long time ago. But there are some. He died in 1961 at the age of 95. And he was still head of the church at that time with some AIDS because he was of advanced age. Um, But when you hear him speak, and I say hear because you really feel like that even when you're reading excerpts of sermons and when you're hearing him pray, which is recorded actually, what he is doing, what it is, the spontaneity of the things that he says are words that are quickened of the spirit. It is as though he is actually preaching and translating his tongues because the manner of the speech is not of a normal syntax the way you would speak in English. It is as though he is Praying in tongues, but it's in English so that we can be edified just as he prayed. So I'm going to read. This was one of the things that I copied, a booklet that the older gentleman had. And it. I just started reading it um, the other day. And I really just couldn't put it down. So, let's see, on page 36, I had to pull the booklet apart and copy it like that and then cut it apart and then reorganize the pages. That was T. 
tedious. So, here we go. This says, A Prayer by Bishop Mason. Listen to this. Now, who prays like this? Who talks like this? The Spirit of God. When you're speaking in tongues, you, it says, and they all, let's get it right. Acts chapter 2. Verse four, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So whose words, who's talking? The Spirit. Whew. Listen, Jesus the mighty gift of God's calling. He would spontaneously say these things. Anoint the will of these little ones and let the blessings of God in the spirit keep them all day. For the day of the Lord is wisdom today and forever. The mystery of iniquity is working. Help us forgive the sins of all and make not my soul ashamed. We wait on thee to give us understanding and knowledge. Let thy wisdom death rebuke. Thou dost love us more and we look for thy coming. Give these to suffer for thy name's sake that they might receive thy love. Bless these to suffer for thy name's sake that they might receive thy love. Bless these in the peace of thy praise. And in the counsel of thy will, which they may walk in thy steps, having controlling power. Father, let it be so that we have the likeness of Jesus and, and the spirit of his greatness. We bless thee for thou art worthy. May our prayers be for men everywhere thy beauty seen. In the spirit of the Lord Jesus, make us in all things say, yes, Lord. In thy spirit, put us in the love of God more and more, contending for him who comes by the gospel. Lord, deliver us, giving us what to do and how to do it, that we may not be deceived, but be inclined to serve thee more. Open our eyes to behold thy wonders, thy kingdoms come. Father, we thank thee for Jesus, the mystery of thy grace in our minds, the hope of the nations sent to deliver souls from bondage by the spirit of love. Amen. Now, who prays like that? So packed, so jam packed. Nobody can spontaneously think of those deep things like that. Except the, the spirit have control of their mouth and their tongue. And his sermons were the same way. The same way. Just this. And, and the video that I'll link below of him praying this one particular video, people are just overcome because of the presence of God and the power in his words. When I was a sinner and I didn't want to be saved. I was, uh, I was at my mother's house. This was years ago, probably 20, 21 years ago. And this um, particular prayer had been put on CD by someone. CDs were kind of new then. 
So um, it was just made available. These recordings were being made available and published and being sold. So I had a chance to hear this man pray who I'd only heard his name. Man, I'm, I was a sinner, sinning, sinner, wicked, demon possessed, didn't know it, but I was. And I could barely stand to listen to his prayer. Something was, was stirring in me. Something just felt like screaming. That's how powerful those words were. I know that they were the words of the Spirit. I believe if I would have if I would have just set my mind to that prayer, all the demons would have had to go out of me right then. But I I had to I, I had to I had to like leave leave the room just to keep from losing it. That's how powerful it was. Just powerful. So when this man prayed, the Spirit just had his way with him, through him and in him. He would pray for hours. He was altogether sold out to God. And God used him. I'm going to see if I can find his account of um, him being filled with the Holy Ghost. And there's also some writings of him teaching on the Holy Ghost. And all this time, I'm struggling to explain, you know, what is the Holy Ghost? What is the need for the Holy Ghost? How do you get the Holy Ghost and all that? And and here it is so perfectly laid out by the mind of the Spirit in this man. So I don't got to struggle with it no more. I can just read you what he said. Okay. Praise God. I'll I'll read this and then um, maybe I'll continue in another video. Okay. Real quick, this is what Bishop Mason said about when he went to Arkansas Baptist College, November 1st, 1893. 1893, I said. He says, quoting, I entered the Arkansas Baptist College November 1st, 1893, and stayed about three months. Now, there's some people who wanted to take the church off into directions of seminaries and doctrines of divinity and oh, all these dignified, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, Bishop Mason went to Bible college and he stayed. No. He he got out of that devilment. And this is out of his own mouth. He said, I entered the Arkansas Baptist College November 1st, 1893 and stayed about three months. I entered so that an education would help me out in preaching. The Lord showed me that there was no salvation in school and colleges. For the way they were conducted grieved my very soul. And I packed my books, then arose and bade them a final farewell to follow Jesus with the Bible as my sacred guide. 
Not long after this incident, when I began to lift up Christ by word, example, and precept in my ministry, the word drew the people from the streets, roadsides, and from the utmost parts of the country. Very soon, the word of God began to sanctify the people everywhere. He sent me, bless his holy name. So, like I said, that schooling that he was against was seminary doctrines. Going to some college to learn about the spirit in the Bible. How can you do that? So this is Elder Mason tells of receiving the Holy Ghost. All right. Blessed friends. This was in 1907. Mm -mm -mm. Woo, praise the Lord. So, in the meantime, this is Bishop Mason. I'll just keep reading. He said, in, 19, in 1895, 1895, I met with Elder C.P. Jones of Jackson, Mississippi, who was very sweet in spirit of the Lord and prayed much. I loved him with unfeigned love. Elder J.A. Jeter, W.S. Pleasant, and many others became my companions in the faith. In 1896, we called a meeting at Jackson, Mississippi. It was a wonderful meeting of power and outpour of the Spirit of the Lord in which many were converted, sanctified, and healed by the power of faith. The wonderful work done in this meeting brought a more international relation among the brotherhood by which we were able to turn many to the Lord in this faith. In 1897, the fire of this new light fell at Lexington, Mississippi, where there was soon established a church of God in Christ. This church was set up in an old gin on the bank of a little creek. The people covered the earth from many miles around. The devil being stirred shot in on us while some were shouting and praying. This wonderful catastrophe of the meeting being reported through the newspaper served more as an advertisement than a hindrance. They came as never before. This is not Azusa Street. This is before that. This is um, in the late 1800s, the late 1890s, when he met with um, C.P. Jones because they were both out of the Baptist tradition and they believed in holiness and sanctification unto God. Not, you know, once saved, always saved. Jesus died for you, so continue in sin and be a filthy, sloppy mess. They believed that God called men to be holy. And if you didn't live holy, you were still going to hell. And because of this, They were rejected and excommunicated and thrown out of the Baptist fellowship. And so these like-minded men who were so thrown out of Baptist churches came together and formed what was the seeds of the Church of God in Christ 10 years before the entity that we know now 
as the Church of God in Christ was formed solely under Bishop Mason. So these men came together formally in 1897 and formed the denomination. God gave them the name through Bishop Mason, the Church of God in Christ, and they organized, and C.P. Jones was the chief leader. So he's telling the story of how they all met and came together. So they, they made a, a church and a meeting place out of an old gin. And you know what a gin was? was a cotton gin. A place where they processed cotton and took the seeds and the sticks and the and the chaff out of the cotton and and made it ready to go on to further markets after coming out of the field. So this was an abandoned cotton men, mill down by a creek, and they began to meet there. So they got some you know bad press. The Lord was blessing them because they were seeking him in holiness, but not with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, just in salvation and sanctification of the spirit. I mean, sanctification of the believer, which sets you up to be filled with the Holy Ghost if you desire. So let's keep going. So. The devil, thinking that he's hindering the meeting, giving them bad press, actually drew people to the meeting. Same thing happened in Azusa. So they came as never before. They said that if the sanctified people were having meetings under such conditions, it truly must be of the Lord. We bought a lot, a lot, like a plot of land on the Zazu Street just beyond the corporate line and built a little edifice 60 by 40 from Mrs. John um, Ashcraft who owned a spot and dedicated it to God. Very early, it was discovered that this house was too small for many times we were forced to carry all the seats out of doors to make room for all to see and hear. In 1906, we built a large brick church, more commodious and accommodating to all, which cost $6,000. Okay. In 1907, Elder Mason began to hunger and thirst for a more entire fullness of God. So this was the same year that the Azusa Street Revival broke out. So him with these other men that he was joined with, and the chief of them was C.P. Jones. They formed a group called the Church of God in Christ. They had churches. They were growing and spreading um, under the banner of holiness and sanctification unto God. Okay. So Elder Mason began to hunger and thirst for a more entire fullness of God until he wanted to put everything down and go somewhere and wait in prayer till his soul became satisfied. The man just hungered after God. He just wanted more. In the meantime, there came a report of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Los Angeles, California. Brother C.P. Jones, one whom Elder Mason loved, opened his eyes to the fact that we did not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, according to Matthew 10 and 12, which showed clearly that we might have power to heal the sick, cast out the devils, 
and to raise the dead, yet not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay. He further called the elders' attention to John 15, 3 and John 17, 12, that we could be kept free from sin and yet not have the Holy Ghost. He also showed him John 1, 1, 31 through 32, that John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost. Here he saw that a jug could be full of water and not be in the water. He told him about the day of Pentecost when they received him and the the miraculous change that took place. The light of these words did not go out of his heart. He also told him that the great blessing was for him and that God would bestow upon him the same. I was led by the Spirit, states Elder Mason, to go to Los Angeles, California, where the great fire of the latter reign of the Holy Ghost had fallen on many. It was in March 1907 when I received him, Jesus, my Lord, in the Holy Ghost. Okay, so now what we know is that Bishop Mason was a holy man, a sanctified man, a man that loved God, a man that did not practice sin, and a man hungry after God, and he yet did not have the Holy Ghost. He was a believer. He was baptized in water, but he did not have the Holy Ghost, and he wanted it. So at one one video I made, I said, you know, I didn't know people were saved before they got the Holy Ghost. But like I said, you know, I'm learning. And I read in his writings that, and this is what they taught. And I remember people saying this now, that you don't get the Holy Ghost in order to get saved. They said that you get the Holy Ghost because you are saved. So you don't tarry for the Holy Ghost to be saved, but you're baptized with the Holy Ghost because you are saved. So, Elder Mason, who was Elder Mason at that time, C.P. Jones sent him and two other brothers, the three of them, to go out to Los Angeles, California and investigate these happenings that were being noised all across the country. This movement was the birthplace of every individual in the United States today that identifies themselves as Pentecostal. It all started right there in Los Angeles, California at 312 Azusa Street in 1906. So in 1907, Bishop Mason and two of his companions that were all out of this group of men that because of their seeking of holiness and insistence on holiness were were kicked out of the Baptist church. So they formed their own thing to pursue holiness. And their leader, C.P. Jones, you know, sent them to go and see what's going on in California. Let's go see about this thing. See if it's of God. So Elder Mason says, the first day in the meeting, I sat to myself from those that went with me, talking about the two brothers. I saw and heard some things that did not look scriptural to me, but at this, I did not stumble. Now, what that means is that 
you know, whenever God is manifesting himself, the devil will try to come out. You may see um, you know, sometimes there may be among you people who have unclean spirits and they may begin to cry out and it takes discernment for people to recognize, oh, that's not God. We, we need to go, we need to rebuke that. We need to cast that out. We need to correct that. Don't let that go forth because the devil only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's the hinderer. He comes to break up the work of God, tear it down and keep it from going forward to hinder. He comes to hinder me all the time. So he, he no doubt saw some things like that. I also heard another account of um, this gentleman and this woman. They were old. They were in their 70s. At the time, they were making a recording in 1974. And they had been children in the Azusa Street Revival. And, and then the woman said, oh, you know, oh, sometimes, you know, the devil would show up. And, and Bishop, Bishop Seymour, he had a way he could tell when something wasn't right. Even if he wasn't there, he might be upstairs. And, and you can tell the sound of the edifying sound of the spirit from the disruption of the devil. Like I told you, I watched a YouTube video one time. These people put this video up and they said this man was receiving the Holy Ghost. And this man looked more like demons were just wrestling with him and he's just carrying on. Eyes all rolled back in his head about foaming at the mouth. And I said, these people have no discernment. They need to cast the devil out of that man. But if they had the power to cast the devil out of that man, they wouldn't have been standing there saying that this was him receiving all the ghosts. Anyway, so Bishop Mason said he saw some things that didn't look scriptural, but he didn't stumble at that because the devil's going to show up. You just need Holy Ghost filled discerning people. And when he shows up, they'll bind him up. So Bishop Mason goes on. I began to thank God in my heart for all things. For when I heard some speak in tongues, I knew it was right. Though I did not understand it. Nevertheless, it was sweet to me. Same thing happened to me. First time I heard somebody speak in tongues. I was about 30, 31. And I instantly knew what it was. I had never heard nobody speak in tongues. I'd never read Acts 2 and 4, but I knew that it was the Holy Ghost. And it it's was wonderful. And I wanted it. That just seemed like something that was unattainable to me. It, it just was like, God, you know, could I ever be that close to God? Could God ever so favor me as to come inside of me and speak in my body? And speak out of my mouth. Bishop Mason says, nevertheless, it was sweet to me. I also thank God for Elder Seymour. William J. Seymour. Who came and preached a wonderful sermon. His words were sweet and powerful. And it seems that. I hear them now while writing. Wonderful. Remember what the people said in John? The Pharisees said, the, the chief priests and Pharisees said, why haven't you taken him? Why didn't you grab Jesus like we told you? Arrest him. And they said, never a man spake like this before. This is a difference. When God is really there. 
There's a difference when a man is full of the Holy Ghost than just some puffed up, pompous, money grubbing windbag. That for a pretense make long prayers and go in long robes and devour widows' houses like Jesus told us. It's a difference. He spoke with authority, not like the scribes. Praise you, Lord. He said his words were sweet and powerful. And it seems that I hear them now while writing. When he closed his sermon, he said, all of those, this was the first day of the meeting. The first day in the meeting, not of the meeting. The meeting started in, in uh, 1906. Bishop Mason, they didn't get out there till March of 1907. He went out there and stayed five weeks. So when he closed his sermon, he said, all those that want to be sanctified or baptized with the Holy Ghost, go to the upper room. And all those that want to be healed, go to the prayer room. And those that want to be justified, come to the altar. I said that is the place for me, for it may be that I am not converted. This is Bishop Mason. He saw something that he didn't have and wanted it. Satan says to me, if you get converted, will you tell me? I said, yes, for I know if I was not convinced and God did convert me, it would tell for itself. I stood on my feet while waiting at the altar, fearing someone would bother me. But I said in my mind that if I ever get to that altar and get my back turned on the people, I will see them. I will see them about getting me away. Just as I attempted to bow down, someone called me and said, the pastor wants you three brethren in his room. I obeyed and went up. Okay. Now, if you've ever looked into anything regarding the Azusa Street Revival, and I just picture this man was in that building. This man was in that mission 111 years ago. And if you remember, or I'll tell you if you didn't know, Elder Seymour lived upstairs from the downstairs part where the, where the meetings went on. This place had been a converted stable. Very humble place. They made pews out of planks. And the pulpit was some crates nailed together. Sharecroppers, farmers, Negroes, poor white folks at the beginning. So he says he gets down there to that altar where he had longed to get. And then somebody comes and tells him, you know, Bishop Seymour wants you to come upstairs. Because this thing went on 24 hours a day. Seven hours days a week for three years from 1906 into 1909 
It went on past that time, but the 24 hours, seven days a week thing was the first three years. That's about how long it takes for the devil to mess something up. Help me, Lord. All right, so the so Bishop Seymour, Pastor Seymour, want calls them up. So that's him and Jeter and the other brother that he went out there with. He said, I obeyed and went up. He received us and seemed to be so glad to see us there. He said, brethren, the Lord will do great things for us and bless us. He cautioned us not to be running around in the city seeing worldly pleasures, but seek pleasure of the Lord. Now, if you, you're coming out there to receive the Holy Ghost, this was the advice. And this is what I say to you now. If you're seeking the Holy Ghost, you got to turn away from the pleasures of the world. You got to want the Holy Ghost more than you want your next breath. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Okay. So he says, he cautioned us not to be running around the city seeking worldly pleasure, but seek pleasure of the Lord. The word suited me. The word just suited me. At that time, a sister came into the room at the time we were bowing to pray, one that I had a thought about that might not have been right. I had not seen her for a number of years. I arose says, um, I arose, took her into a room and confessed it to her. And we prayed. I arose and returned to the pastor's room and began to pray again. So what is he saying? That he had an ought against a, a, a sister. He, he They had a, something between them. And he went and wanted to clear that up. That's another thing you got to do if you want the Holy Ghost. Just don't let no unclean, unpure thing rest in your heart. Get it all straight. Okay. He said, I arose and returned to the pastor's room and began to pray again. And the enemy got into a minister. See, I told you the devil's always going to show up. A brother to tempt me. He opened his Bible and said, look. And I said to him, go away. I don't want to be bothered. And he tempted me the third time, but I refused to hear him. I told him that he did not know what he wanted and I knew what I needed. So that brother, he, so you imagine you praying, you trying to pray and you trying to get through to God. And, and here come your friend that's distracted, mind all over the place, not hungry like you hungry. And come to my, here, look, 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 trying to shove a Bible in your face. There's some things that may seem good, but they're not the time. It's not the time. They're out of place. That's how the devil operates. He doesn't come, obviously. He might come with the right thing at the wrong time which makes it not the right thing. What's wrong with looking at the Bible? Nothing, unless, you, unless you're supposed to be praying. This guy was trying to distract him. The devil working through him, trying to distract him. That's what the devil will do when you're trying to pray, when you're on the altar, which we, we're never on the altar anymore because the churches are dead. So you got to make an altar of your own. You got to make an altar of the foot of your bed. Let me keep going. Hurry up. So he told the guy, don't bother me. And it turns out that this guy was Jeter, the guy that came with him. Okay. So I said to him, go away. I don't want to be bothered. And he tempted me the third time, but I refused to hear him. 
I told him that he did not know what he wanted, and I knew what I needed. I did not intend to be interfered by anyone, so he gave me up and ceased to annoy me further. Though he was a man that I loved as myself, Elder J.A. Jeter of Little Rock, Arkansas, and D.J. Young of Pine, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, we three went together, boarded together, and prayed for the same blessing. Boarded meaning we, they stayed. Wherever they stayed, they stayed in the same place together. Because they came from, they were sent by um, C.P. Jones to investigate what was going on out in California. What was this thing? What was this move? Was this something that would be um, good for us? So the enemy had put into the ear of Brother Jeter to find fault with the work, but God kept me out of it. That night, the Lord spoke to me that Jesus saw all of this world wrong, that Jesus the Lord spoke to me that Jesus saw all of this world's wrong, but did not attempt to set it right until God overshadowed him with the Holy Ghost. When did Jesus' ministry begin? He was baptized in water by John the Baptist, at which time the heavens opened up because Jesus was born sanctified. We have to be sanctified to receive the Holy Ghost. You don't just get, you just don't get the Holy Ghost when you get baptized. You may repent of your sins and the Lord may accept your repentance. He may accept your sorrow and he may forgive your sins and, and you still need to be sanctified. You still need to learn the ways of God and you, you still got things that, that are, are, uh, Sticky spots for you. You got some things that that are going to come back and tempt you again. And you may not have overcome them. That's not being sanctified. But Jesus, the heavens opened up. The, the spirit descended on him in the bodily form as a dove. Now, did that happen to you when you got baptized? Well, then you didn't get the Holy Ghost at your baptism. Some people do get the Holy Ghost at their baptism and they speak with tongues. So let's keep going. So the enemy had put into the ear of Brother Jeter to find fault with the work, but God kept me out of it. That night, the Lord spake to me that Jesus saw all of this world's wrong, but did not attempt to set it right until God overshadowed him with the Holy Ghost. And he said that I was no better than my Lord. And if I wanted him to baptize me, I would have to let the people's rights and wrongs all alone and look to him and not to the people. And he would baptize me. And I said yes to God, for it was him who I wanted to baptize me and not the people. Glory. The second night of prayer, I saw a vision. I saw myself standing alone and had a dry roll of paper. I had to chew it when I had gotten it all in my mouth, trying to swallow it, looking up towards the heavens. There appeared a man at my side. I turned my eyes at once. Then I awoke and the interpretation came. God had me swallow the whole book. And that if I did not turn my eyes to anyone but God and him only, he would baptize me. I said yes to him. And at once in the morning when I arose, I could hear a voice in me saying, I see. I had joy, but was not satisfied. A sister began to tell me about the faults that were among the saints. But I stopped as she did not, but stopped as she did not want to hinder me by telling me of them. I sat and looked at her and said, 
You all may stand on your heads. God has told me what to do. God is going to baptize me. So I came to the mission and found the brother that I had left fighting. He had turned the other way. A sister began speaking in tongues and said, The voice of the Lord in my heart that there is something. Mm -mm, Wait a minute. I saw a sister speaking in tongues and said, The voice of the Lord in my heart, that there is something in that for Jesus. So when he saw the woman speaking in tongues, he said, uh, you know, that he knew that this was the Lord, that this was of the Lord. And he said, if there is anything For Jesus, I want it. So he went and bowed down at her feet. Wait, 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 wait. So I came to the mission and found the brother that I had left fighting. And he had turned the other way. A sister began speaking in tongues and said, The voice of the Lord says in my heart that there is something in that for Jesus. And he said, if there is anything for Jesus, I want it. So this is the brother said that. So he went and bowed down at her feet for all to pray for him. I was going to take my seat by him. I was left standing on my feet. Then the enemy enemy came to show me what I had missed by being out of the meeting. I would not reason with him, but said, Go from me. He was trying to get me to condemn myself. When I would reason with him, he tried to show me that it was only deceit in Brother Jeter, for he knew that I knew his way toward women, but I would not reason with the devil. So I guess Brother Jeter liked the ladies. I don't know. Um, I got me a place at the altar and began to thank God. After that, I said, Lord, if I could only baptize myself, I would do so. For I wanted the baptism so bad that I did not know what to do. I said, Lord, you will have to do the work for me. So I just turned it all over into his hands to do the work for me. A brother came and prayed for me. I did not feel any better or any worse. One sister came and said, Satan will try to make you feel sad, but that is not the way to receive him. You must be glad and praise the Lord. I told her that I was letting the Lord search my heart, for I did not want to receive the new wine in old bottles. But I said, my heart does not condemn me. Then I quoted the scripture to her who readeth thus, beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. 1 John 3, 21 through 22. Then I realized in my heart that I had confidence in God and did not have to get it for my heart for my heart was free from condemnation. Then I began to seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost according to Acts 2:44 which readeth thus Then they that gladly received his word were baptized Then I saw that I had a right to be glad and not sad as the enemy was trying to make me believe the way the as as the enemy was trying to make me believe the way the word put him out. There came a reason in my mind which said, 
Were you sad when you were going to marry? I said, no, I was glad. It said that this meant wedlock to Christ. Then I saw more in being glad than in being sad. The enemy said to me, there may be something wrong with you. Then a voice spoke to me and said, if there is anything wrong with you, Christ will find it and take it away and will marry you at any rate and will not break the vow. More light came and my heart rejoiced. Some said, let us sing. I arose and the first song that came to me was he brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. The spirit came upon the saints and upon me. After which I soon sat down and soon my hands went up and I resolved in my heart not to take them down until the Lord baptized me. The enemy tried to show me again how much pain it would cause me to endure, not knowing how long it would be before the Lord baptized me. The enemy said that I might not be able to hold out, but the spirit rebuked him and said that the Lord was able to make me stand. And if not, I would be a liar. And the spirit gave me to know that I was looking to God and not to myself for anything. The sound of a mighty wind was in me and I cried, Jesus only, none like you. My soul cried and soon I began to die. It seemed that I heard the groaning of Christ on the cross dying for me. All of the work in me until I died out of the old man. The sound stopped for a little while. My soul cried, oh God, finish your work in me. Then the sound broke out again, broke out in me again. Then I felt something raising me out of my seat without any effort of my own. I said, it may be imagination. Then I looked down to see if it was really so. I saw that I was rising. Then I gave up for a wave of glory in me and all of my being was filled with the glory of the Lord. So when he had gotten me straight on my feet, there came a light which enveloped the entire being above the brightness of the sun. It enveloped my entire being above the brightness of the sun. When I opened my mouth to say glory, a flame touched my tongue, which ran down me. My language changed and no word could I speak in my own tongue. Oh, I was filled with the glory of the Lord. My soul was then satisfied. I rejoiced in Jesus, my Savior, whom I love so dearly. And from that day until now, there has been an overflowing joy of the glory of the Lord in my heart. After five weeks, I left Los Angeles, California for Memphis, Tennessee, my home. The fire had fallen before my arrival. Brother Glenn Gook of Los Angeles, California was there telling the story and the Lord was sending the rain. I was full of the power when I reached home. The spirit had taken full control of me and everything was new to me and the saints. You need the Holy Ghost. The way that he went after things was all new. The way he did change was the same. At the same time, I soon found that he could and was teaching me all things and showing the things of the Lord. He taught me how and what to sing, and all his songs were new the third day after he began with me in Memphis. I asked him to give me the interpretation of what was spoken in tongues. I did not understand what the Spirit was saying through me, so that they might have been edified, 
My prayers weren't in vain. The Lord stood me up on the day and began to speak in tongues and interpret the same. He soon gave me the gift of interpretation. And this, he would interpret sounds, groans, and any kind of spiritual utterance. Okay, then it says, of the events when he returned back to Jackson, Mississippi from the Azusa revival. The new Pentecostal experience which Elder Mason found for himself, for he began to proclaim to others upon his return to Memphis, Tennessee, and the New Testament doctrine. As a New Testament doctrine, a division subsequently came evident within the ranks of Elder Ms. Mason's contemporaries when Elder J.A. Jeter, the general overseer, Elder C.P. Jones, and others regarded the new Holy Ghost experience of speaking in tongues as a delusion. Being unable to resolve their differences in doctrine, the General Assembly convened at Jackson, Mississippi in August of 1907 to discuss this New Testament doctrine. The General Assembly terminated by withdrawing the right hand of fellowship from C.H. Mason. This is the second time that Elder C.H. Mason has been excommunicated from his parent church. He had been excommunicated from the Baptist church because of the doctrine of sanctification. Now he is being excommunicated from the church of God in Christ that was under the auspices of C.P. Jones, forcing him to organize another church. Elder Mason then called a conference in Memphis, Tennessee, of all the ministers who believed in receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost according to the scripture in Acts 2, 1 through 4. Those who responded to Elder Mason's urgent call were E.R. Driver. J. Bowie, R. R. Booker, R. E. Hart, D. W. Welch, A. A. Blackwell, E. M. Page, R. H. I. Clark, D. H. Young, J. Brewer, Daniel Spearman, M. W. Roberts, and J. H. Boone. These men of God organized the first Pentecostal General, General Assembly of the Church of God in Christ. Overseer C.H. Mason was then chosen unanimously as the general overseer and chief apostle of our denomination. He was given complete authority to establish doctrine, organize auxiliaries, and appoint overseers. So you see, the first church of God in Christ was all those ministers who had pulled away from the Baptist church under C.P. Jones, started in 1897. Ten years later, they split from each other when Bishop Mason went out to Azusa in March of 1907, stayed out there five weeks, came back and told him about his experiences. They rejected it and put him out. And he made a call to those because he had told what happened and to those that believed it. They came together and they began what is now the church of God in Christ. But it's nothing like what it was. And in subsequent videos, I'm going to tell you about how this church was under this man. And I'm going to read to you the eulogy that was spoken over this man when he died in 1961. So hopefully this video wasn't too long and it recorded God bless you and I'll be back.